Now on overnight. I believe in reason and common sense. Leith Van Onselen from Macro Business with a treasury of common sense. Common sense never goes out of style. Well, as we've spoken about across the week, the Reserve Bank kept interest rates on hold, 4.35%. There is some suggestion, perhaps, that there could still be an increase later in the year. Leith Van Olsen, the co-founder of Macro Business, we chat to every week on the program. G'day, Leith. Yeah, g'day, Clinton. How are you? I'm good, mate. This was expected, wasn't it? Yeah, pretty much, mate. Look, there, there, was a, there was a few outliers who thought that maybe we might get a rate hike, but pretty much most economists out there thought that the Reserve Bank was going to hold, which is exactly what it did. Um, I think it's been pretty sensible, actually, in its positioning. It's basically taken a neutral stance. So it said that it's concerned about the you know higher than expected inflation in the March quarter, but it's also concerned about the ultra-weak consumer spending. Um, so, you know, it's effectively hedging its bets uh, mm. and it said that it's going to wait for upcoming data to form a view on whether, you know, rates should go up or down or stay and hold, whatever. And the next sort of key data points to look for uh, will come out actually next week. So uh, we've got the next, next week, we've got the Q2 wage price index, which is basically the, you know, the, which tells us how fast wages are growing. And th- we've also got the March labour force data. So that's, that's where you get the unemployment rate and that sort of thing. So that'll be the sort of next tell to see where we're going. And, uh, you know, my, my tip's that, that they're probably going to be weak, a bit weaker than expected, in which case, uh, you know, we'll have to wait and see because they, they, these things go up and down like a yo-yo, so you never really know. Um, but, uh, yeah, it, the RBA is taking a sensible approach. They're, they're, they're on neutral. They're not taking a position either way. They're just going to wait and see what the data tells them, which is sensible. But Michelle Dart, uh, Michelle Bullock did say that she wasn't ruling anything in, she wasn't ruling anything out. Some analysts interpreted that, that, that there could be a rise still later in the year. But is that is that really what she's got to say, particularly after the previous government put his foot in a few years ago? Yeah, look, I mean, again, I think she's just been pragmatic. I mean, we've got, we've got sort of two, two opposing forces here, so... So the inflation's been a little bit stubborn. It's a little bit higher than they forecast. Not not by much, but a little bit. And so, you know, obviously they've got to take that into account. But at the same time, the, the household sector in particular is getting absolutely smashed. And we actually got some data this week which just added, you know, fuel to the fire there. And, and uh, you know, Governor Bullock's basically a little, you know, concerned about that, that, we're, that the economy is actually slowing fairly quickly. So mm. he's sort of hedging her bets. Uh, and... The data I talk about is on Tuesday, the Bureau of Statistics released its quarterly retail sales data. And what that showed is that real per capita retail sales have fallen by 5.7% since mid-2022. So the, so households are cutting back quite sharply once you factor out population growth. And and that pretty much aligns with, uh, you might remember, I think it was last week, I, I mentioned that Australia's had, Australian households have had the biggest decline in household disposable incomes in the world. So they went down 6% last year. And surprise, surprise, you know, households with their incomes falling have cut back on their expenditure. And the fall in retail sales has actually been led, led by discretionary sort of items. So eating out, um, you know, household goods, those sorts of things. So households are heeding, the, you know, the, what, what, what the, um, the Reserve Bank's warning. They are cutting back their expenditure. And the household consumption accounts typically, so if you, you know, in his, historically accounts for about 60% of the nation's economic growth. So if that's slowing... Uh, it's a pretty good sign that the uh, you know that the economy is slowing, which is why Governor Bullock's been you know very cautious. The data from Seek is interesting. Seek, one of the biggest employment websites in the country, and it it is showing the number of people applying for each job ad is increasing. Oh, mate, massively. So uh, on uh, on Wednesday, Seek released their they they, they have a uh, monthly labour market data. So what they basically give you is they give you the number of job ads which is effectively employers' demand for labour and also the applications per job ad. So that's that's a function of two things. That's a function of, A, the number of job ads, but also the, num- the number of people applying for those job ads. And both of those series are going the wrong way. So effectively, the number of job ads across Australia has fallen you know, very severely. It's back down to early 2021 levels. And so that basically tells you that the demand from employers for labour is falling. At the same time, the number of applicants for those jobs is rocketing because there's very high immigration we've got. So we're importing workers hand over fist at record rates. And those people are effectively uh, competing for fewer jobs. And what's, well, what that's meant is that Seek's data shows that the number of applicants per job has soared 70% above where it was in pre, pre-pandemic, which is just an astronomical figure. And this series has historically tracked very closely with the unemployment rate. 
But for some reason, in the last six months, it's decoupled from the unemployment rate. So the official unemployment rate's at, I think, was it 3.9%. But six job ad, uh, applications per job ad series has rocketed 60% above pre-pandemic levels. And I expect those two series to sort of normalise and unemployment to jump very sharply because there's just no way you can have that many people competing for a smaller pool of jobs and not see unemployment rise. So I think the ABS labour market series is actually the outlier here. And it has, and it, and it does, you know, it, there are some survey issues at the moment where, not, not just in Australia, but around the world where the employment, the government employment agencies are having trouble measuring the very high, high immigration in places like Australia, New Zealand, Canada, et cetera. And that's potentially leading them to understate what the true level of unemployment is. And reality is that if, if the unemployment rate does rise, the RBA board's not going to be able to increase interest rates. No, no, and and and, and the, the the RBA has basically two uh, two KPIs, key performance indicators. So one of them is obviously inflation. So they want to keep it, you know, uh, between two and a half and three percent, which is its its mandate. At the same time, they also want to have uh, full employment. And obviously, if you've got any unemployment rising, well, they're not going to meet the second one. And also, if unemployment rises, it's a pretty good sign that the economy is slowing down aggressively. And it also means that inflation is going to come down. Also, wage growth is going to come down. So I think that's why the RBA has been so cautious here because, you know, yes, inflation is a little bit higher than where, where they want it. But at the same time, the household sector has been smashed. And they also, but the, the, the Reserve Bank's not stupid. They, they'd see this data. And although the official unemployment rate's still good, these secondary sort of uh, series statistics, which have traditionally tracked the unemployment rate, are all, all looking very bad. And the RBA would know this. Mm. And the, the interesting stat to come out of it, Clinton, uh, given that I'm talking to a you know mostly New South Wales audience, is that the migrant epicenters of New South Wales, but also Victoria, are facing the biggest rise in unemployment. So, Seek's uh, job ad series showed that New South Wales and Victoria, their job ads have collapsed back to 2019 levels. So that just tells you that they're leading the decline in job ads. At the same time, we know that both those jurisdictions, so New South Wales and Victoria, are receiving most of the migrants. So um, I've mentioned previously that New South Wales got 186,000 migrants last uh, in, the, in the year of September. So what this meant is that what this means is that this huge volume of migrants that are coming in New South Wales is obviously competing for that for the for this uh, for a lot fewer jobs. And as a result, the number of applicants per job ad in uh, New South Wales has climbed about 75% above pre-pandemic levels. So, so it's actually leading the nation, uh, which is really bad news if you're from New South Wales, because all it means is that the, this data is pointing to even heavier job losses in New South Wales and Victoria than their national average. But Michelle Bullock doesn't seem to think that the immigration, the high rate of migrants coming here is actually causing the inflation or contributing to it. Yeah, this this was a real faux pas yesterday. So, uh, sorry, on Wednesday, I should say. Um, so Governor Bullock in the Q&A question and answer session was asked about immigration's impact on inflation. And what she basically said was that she admitted that strong immigration is driving up housing inflation, most most notably in the rental market, but also prices. But then what she said is that that high inflation in rents and house prices is being offset by immigration dampening wage growth. So she said that basically the impact on inflation overall isn't as strong as you think because although, yes, we've got this very high uh, housing inflation, it's actually dampening wage growth. Now, I, I disagree with her on that, but but even if, if, if we take her comments at face value and using her logic, what she's basically saying is, is is that this record immigration is an absolute disaster for working Australians because, according to her, and it's lowering their wages, which I think is correct, but it's also driving up their cost of living through having to pay more for housing. So... Anybody trying to rent a, rent a house or buy a house in Australia can see that, that the current immigration levels are highly inflationary, especially for them. And all she basically proved was that high immigration is a disaster for working Australians. Just lastly, Leith, we'll talk about this next week, obviously, but the budget's going to be handed down on Tuesday night. Uh, Jim Chalmers will do that in Parliament. Are you expecting a, a big budget pre-election plan from Labor? Uh, I don't think so. I think there might be too much heat on them if they do that. Yeah. Um, but, but, you know, I wouldn't be surprised if they have some sweeteners in there. And, look, provided they – it's not it's not ideal. They should really fix the underlying problems, obviously. Like, you know, on, on the rental side, they should slow immigration. They should also fix the energy market to stop these 
you know, massive energy price inflation we've had by, I've said previously, by by reforming the East Coast gas market so that we're not paying world prices, given that we export 80% of our gas overseas. It's just ridiculous. But what, what I think they'll end up doing is they won't obviously fix the underlying problems. They might end up giving some sweetness. So they might increase, say, for example, the Commonwealth rent assistance, uh, which is a subsidy for lower income renters, as well as maybe some energy rebates, similar to what Queensland did. And although that's not an ideal way of going about it and it's going to spend taxpayer money and I'd rather than fix the, fix the problem, the impact on inflation is kind of muted because those measures will bring down rental inflation directly, bring down energy inflation directly, um, although it will end up giving households more money, which then they'll go and spend. Uh, so they might do those sorts of things. The impact on inflation might be, you know, uh, but it, provided the, the spending's targeted, at areas where there is a pinch point like rental inflation, like energy costs, it won't actually drive up inflation. It could you know, even put some temporary downward pressure on inflation. But again, it's Band-Aid policy. It's not fixing the underlying problems. It's not fixing the policy failures that have caused this inflation mm-hmm. in the first place. We'll talk about all of that uh, next week. Thank you, Matt. We'll talk then. Yeah, thanks, Glenn. Speak to you next time. Leith Van Olsen.